Hello and a warm welcome to the National Center for Writing's Meet the World event in celebration of International Translation Day. The event is programmed in partnership with the British Center for Literary Translation and supported by the British Council. I'm Olivia Sneij and I'm very pleased to be speaking to our three participants today, Sebastian, who's in Argentina where it's morning, An Li in Vietnam where it's evening, and Rabi from Wales where it's around midday. Sebastián is a literary and theatre translator working between Spanish and English. Anne Lee translates from English to Vietnamese and now into English as well. She's also an editor and runs a quarterly about literature in Vietnamese. Rabi is an author, editor and translator from Nepal, now based in Wales, who runs a literary magazine in English and Nepali and perhaps soon in other languages. More extensive bios can be found on the website. We know that translators are bridges to other literatures and ideas. And today we'll be talking about the literary and theater translations and how they not only open up other worlds, but inner worlds as well. We'll talk about the importance of bringing Vietnamese and Nepali literature into other languages and the power of theater and how it can be life-changing. And whether what Sebastian, An Li and Rabi choose to translate is in some way a political decision in the sense of civic, civic or communal. But first, I'd like our translators to tell us briefly what they're all working on right now. Um, Sebastian, would you like to begin? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Um, right now, I'm working on two plays by two local playwrights from where I'm based in, in Cordoba, in Argentina. And both plays uh, explore childhood issues. One of them is Loquat by Matias Rapetti, where, let's say, the relationship between an autistic girl and her father is presented and the challenges of reconnecting up after their mother's death. The other one is called uh, The Girl Who Was Cyrano, and that basically tells us the story of Valentina, who is now a grown-up, but uh, tells us about, about her childhood, uh, where sometimes she felt like a girl, some other times she felt like a boy, and where she, let's say, met love for the first time with a new girl. Who just moved in. The first one is a play by Matias Rapetti. The second one, uh, a play by Guillermo Waldo. Thank you. And and Lee, what are you working on right now? Right now, I'm reviewing the edits of my translation of Chinatown by Tuat. Uh, this is my first uh, translation into English, and the editor is the wonderful Deborah Smith of uh, Tilted Axis Press. And uh, I'm preparing for the, my next translation um, of a book by the same author and I'm trying to think of uh, a different translation strategy because this is quite uh, a different book st style-wise. Meanwhile, I'm finalizing my translation into Vietnamese of Amos Oz, A Tale of Love and Darkness, which I'm quite fond of and hopefully we'll finish um, and see publish this year. That's, that's a lot on your plate. <laughs> um, Ravi, but what are you into these days? Hi, Olivia and everyone else. Uh, good to be here today. Uh, when you ask me what I'm working on, it's kind of a non-operative non word because I'm not imminently working on translations day by day because I have a, a day job. Uh, but what I have been working on in the last, in the last few months is uh, I had the opportunity to go to, 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 to attend a residency at the National Center for Writing, where I worked on a, a, a novella called Boni, which is by the late writer Parijat, Nepali writer Parijat. And it's essentially a, a set of letters written by the, the narrator Parijat, probably, to a young, a young girl who she is alternately scolding and encouraging because she's not quite she's not turning out quite the way she wants to so so this was written in the in the in the late 80s i think and uh, yeah it's a it's a set of half a dozen letters uh written uh, half a dozen letters uh, written to this young address to this young girl what i hope to be working on very soon is uh, a collaboration with strangers press at the university of east anglia's publishing project uh, we're hoping to to work on a series of chapbooks uh, from Nepali to English, probably probably about six to eight chapbooks, and uh, I'm really excited about about look, about working working on this. 
because it'll it'll uh, really give me the opportunity to introduce a whole bunch of new Nepali writers yeah, into English to the English English reading world. Oh, fantastic! And Thanks. and perhaps from from different languages from Nepal, but we can talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, I have a, a just a really basic question because I'm always curious about which languages writers and translators read in when they were children. And um, was this language different, for example, from what you spoke at home? And I was hoping that perhaps you could each describe the, your situations and some of the books that you read that, that made you want to connect with other cultures. And, and maybe we can go the other way around and start with Rabbi <laughs> and you can tell, talk to us about that. I was actually born in England, so I spent the first six years of my life, life here. Uh, around the place. So I grew up speaking pri uh, primarily English to begin with. Uh, you know, uh, my parents were speaking English to me mostly, I guess, in, in England. And when we moved back, I was thrown into this Nepali language culture. And uh, I probably struggled, struggled a bit like my siblings. Uh, I have three sisters. So it was uh, the usual code switching, code mixing. It was an English, uh, an English medium boarding school where I started at in Kathmandu. And uh, they had a very strict policy uh, with, with you know, having to speak English, even though we were living in a you know, Nepali language speaking wider society. So they actually had something called a donkey stick, which uh, was kind of uh, something, I don't know if you've heard of, because uh, I'm, I'm in Wales now, so it's kind of relevant to the history of the Welsh language here as well, where they used to have something called the Welsh knot, which was a a stick or a board you had to wear if you were caught speaking, if you were caught speaking your own language, Welsh. And in, in this boarding school, uh, we, we we were handed something called the donkey stick, which uh, which had our names on them. And if you heard a friend speaking Nepali as well instead of English, you wrote your friend's name on it, you snitched on him, and you gave it to him. And at the end of the week, you would get a nice beating. So that's how the donkey stick worked. So it was this weird kind of culture in which. Uh, you know, Nepali, Nepali language speaking culture in which, uh, you know, due to the nature of the school I was at, we were kind of forced to speak English. Uh, I didn't necessarily have a problem with that because of my background of growing up in uh, growing up in, in, in the UK. But at the same time, I didn't really have a sense that I was, you know, using books to connect to an, a different culture. Uh, it was just it was just the way my education was organized. We had English language books at home. So you know, I read those and it was just, uh, yeah, at the time I didn't question this, this need to speak English because I was comfortable with it, but obviously it was very, it was probably very different for, for kids who were growing up in more Nepali language speaking, speaking households. So, and that's, uh, that's something that the entire culture, uh, in Kathmandu at least is now oriented towards everybody wants to speak English, but they may not have the, have had the opportunity to, to you know, to have English language books around them. Uh, so English is kind of an aspirational, aspirational language for a lot of people because it opens up a lot of opportunities, but not everybody has, has the, the family background or the educational background to, to connect to that. And did you read um, books in Nepali when you were an adult? Did you begin or, or was that a bit earlier? It was, uh, yeah, it's, Due to the, the my, my educational background and the fact that my mom was a, a English language teacher as well, we, we always had English language books at home. So it was a very conscious decision for me to come back to Nepali and say, "Hey, I better reconnect to my culture, such as it is, and you know, read in Nepali language news and Nepali language books." And this is all a bit strange because all the time I was speaking colloquial Nepali with my friends and my relatives and you know, everybody else. So it's this kind of weird situation you're put in where you're not really connected to the literary part of your your mother tongue. I mean, I would consider that I have two mother tongues, but to Nepali language. Uh, yeah, it was something that I consciously had to make an attempt to, 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 to get back to. And I guess translating from Nepali is part of this deliberate connecting. Right. Right. And oh, thank you. And, uh, and Lee, how, how did... Uh... How did English get introduced into your into your world? Well, I was taught English in school from the second class on, but uh, it was a very rudimentary kind of teaching. And um, actually, until until quite recently, 
um, the Vietnamese population is being quite homogeneous, so we mostly talk in Vietnamese and read in Vietnamese. Um, in my case, I I read a lot uh, in Vietnamese when I was small, but the first books that I remember reading was actually um, the Chinese classical novels. I have read uh, some of the novels before I entered primary school, and I I love what I read, but I had already I think uh, compared different translations by then. And when I got to, into primary school, I um, the thing I the things I read mostly were Russian novels, the kind that talks about like um, the war heroism, the utopian vision of their future, and uh, I I don't think I the Vietnamese novels and books until quite late, like um, when I entered um, high school or something. But uh, about English, uh, I think um, it is funny that I first read English in a quite um, serious way was when I started to play video games uh, in my secondary school. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of turn-based strategy games and the narration and the storylines be were beautiful and I had to look up a lot of words in the dictionaries but I loved what I read so when in secondary school when we when we practiced writing English all I, all I wrote were like fantasy things with uh, dragons and magic wells and things like that so it was a very interesting beginning of my relationship with English. Yeah, that's super interesting. Wow. And um, Sebastian, what, what was your experience uh, in reading when you were a kid? As, as a child, I only read uh, in Spanish, which was the language we spoke at home. And I wasn't the avidest reader as a child, but I do have this, this memory of my mom giving me a collection of uh, illustrated books, Disney illustrated books. And it was a collection of 12 books, which was, uh, let's say, one for each month. And as a kid, I always picked the one that was July, because that's when I was born in July. And the cover of it had like the Disney characters on a beach. But here, July is winter. So, and I kept asking my mom, but it's always super cold for my birthday. Why are these characters on the beach? It's July. So I guess that was the first realization of like, oh, other cultures, other places. And even though it's the same word in a different language, different meanings, maybe not as clearly as I am putting it now, but I guess that was my first experience with um, reading and translation. And then um, and later, later in high school, I had to read plays for my uh, language and literature class. And that's where, where I started developing this passion for theater, which in turn, um, let's say, led me to start um, a free drama workshop uh, offered by a public university in my town. And yeah, I kind of like started developing my identity there as, as a queer person. Uh, so I like to, to think about, let's say, those moments as a like decoding of what I was going through, which in turn is what translation is about. Uh, but all of that took place in Spanish, let's say. Um, my contact with English was just like an institute and reading what I had to for that institute. But And through popular culture. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, thank yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, two of you are editors of literary magazines, um, Rabbi and Anne Lee, and Sebastian, you've taught literary translation. So I wanted to know how translation fits into your various careers and, and how its importance to you has changed over the years. Um, Sebastian, maybe you can, I mean, obviously it, it, it began right away, but um, perhaps not the uh, English to Spanish translation or vice versa. Perhaps you can 
start off by talking a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I took a five-year program in translation here in Cordoba, in Argentina. And after I graduated, I spent two years uh, in the literary translation class as a teaching assistant, collaborating with the, with the head teacher. And back then, it was just like uh, wonderful because the syllable covered and explores all different sorts of translations like classics, best-selling novels, uh, graphic novels. Um, so it was very enlightening uh, back then. And it kind of like led me to let's see, some develop my curiosity, researching a bit, analyzing translations, comparing. But uh, there was a point in which that turned just into a field of study for me, which somehow I could say became like a bit lonely just me and uh, source texts, translations, and authors and quoting. So uh, it was then through theater that I realized that, oh, but this is a, actually a very powerful, say, tool, uh, a way to build a representation uh, in a way that I think is more visible, more, more palpable, like uh, a way of actually doing, and at the same time being part of a bigger team because uh, the translation of a play means that then that play will be handed into a creative team that will actually do something with that. So it's like a longer chain, it's not like directly to the reader. And uh, so in a way that, that I think was the process uh, for me in which I gave more and more importance to, to translation. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And... Um... Thank you. And, and Lee, um, you've been involved in translation for a large part of your career, even when you were a child, since you were already comparing translations. Um, but recently, um, you mentioned um, uh, in, in, email, in an email exchange that uh, following one of the issues of, of your literary magazine, which focused on translation, you became interested in, in reintroducing Vietnamese literature to the world. And um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that, because you realized perhaps that some of the translations hadn't been translated the way they ought to be or sh needed to be retranslated. It's a kind of a long story, but I try to keep it short. Uh, I, I have been translating uh, since, I think, maybe in my high school or uh, college, but uh, those are very... Um, beginning pieces and uh, it's not until I got my first job at a publishing house that I got my first translation uh, contract and that was um, I think I can say that I lucked out into that because uh, the the former translator dropped out at the last minute and they need a person who can provide a very fast and still accurate translation and that happened to be uh, Margaret Arus, the hand, handmaid's tale. So uh, it was a very big shock to someone as young as me, but I didn't know it then. You and, started uh, off with a bang. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, actually it started off with the flop because uh, the book was quite a bad seller. I can say a non seller Yeah, but then uh, I think I started out with translation um, quite uh, naturally, and I didn't think much about that. And my my main job was to be an editor and revising and commissioning translations by other people. But when I um, first uh, went to the UK for my M MA degree, I began to I began to think that maybe I should try my hand at translating the books that uh, I love. Yeah, but it's just uh, more like a passing thought. And I don't think that my my English was good enough to to do justice to the very complex and highly nuanced words that I love. So my college and I, when we started the ZZZ review, review uh, t three summers ago, we always thought that we have to to do 
uh, we always thought that we will have to do a, an issue on translation because that is what we have been working on and living with for years, for a dozen years or more now. Um, when we start, when we started preparing for the issue last year, one of the contributors sent to us an essay about um, the English translation of, uh, of the book that I think uh, arguably the most famous novel in Vietnam that has ever been translated into English. It is uh, The Sorrow of War by Bao Ning. I wonder if you have ever heard of it. And uh, in her essay, she analyzed how the translator has like nearly rewritten the book. Not only that he made a lot of mistranslations, he also like uh, changed tones of the narrator and added phrases, added whole sentences. He turned the narrator from a gentle and sorrowful voice into a cynical and harsh voice and he added or revised many moral and political and aesthetic adjustments and in general he he changed the book into something that will suit the American readers more and uh, it came as a shock to us because the book is very famous and its reputation in the US is famous too if you understand what I mean so when we were working with her on the essay I myself um, came to wrapping up my own translation of Chinatown and I I, seek, I sought to see other translations by see other translation of an Amis book that treats the same period of history and what I found out was that uh, I always thought that Vietnamese books were not translated much into English but actually there were a lot of them but they all were like languishing in a academic uh, publishing house or maybe led to go out of print and there is no sense of a Vietnamese literature in the Anglo-Saxon world and what came out through the filter is often war and war and war and we do have a lot of other stories to tell and even our stories of war has um, many perspectives that never get to be known in the US because the kernel reason of the market and the decisions of the translators and the publishers in the US. So and around the, the same time, uh, there was a catalyst in Vietnamese publishing world. A very famous author of the older generation uh, was passed away, and there was a controversy about how his um, works have been translated into English and other languages. And they found out that um, the authors were not paid well at all and in some circumstances wasn't paid um, nearly anything and uh, the ensuing conversations uh, around him after that shows that most of the authors in Vietnam are still very naive when it comes to international publishing and they are prone to be exploited by predatory publishers and even if they are treated well, they are uh, they often like lack the knowledge to to show their best work or to to fight for their rights uh, in their relationships with the publishers and the uh, in the UK or US markets. So we were talking about maybe start a, a grassroots movement to to help like an the agency for for the publishing industry there to help them. Well, one of my contributors 
one of the contributors to our magazine, to our review talked about uh, opening up uh, an agency, but I myself think that I, I myself, I'm thinking more of a grassroots movement, something like a spin-off of our review, uh, so that we can better showcase the works of our authors without necessarily entered a commercial contracts or some business agreement right away. Um, because you know that uh, our ZZZ review is operating on the basis of open access uh, and non-profit. So I'm thinking that the this uh, endeavor to showcase the works of Vietnamese author can also operate on the same basis, open to all and um, well, help p uh, people to help publishers and authors to reach each other without any kind of commission or monetary um, requirements. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, Rabbi, for example, you started out in translation um, by first commissioning translations for your literary magazine. And then you translated yourself from Nepali, I think in 2017. And now you're working on translating um, the author Parijat. Uh, can you maybe talk about how translation seems to be coming, uh, to be coming more important um, in your career or in all the different things that you do? I confess that The Sorrow of War is the only, is the only Vietnamese book that I've read, so I'm kind of horrified to hear that it's a complete mistranslation. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, curious to know what, what a better translation would look like, because I, I was quite impressed by that book. But uh, yeah, in terms of uh, translation, I, I, have to, I have to say that it's, uh, I'm firmly, firmly pushing away any sense that I'm an imposter here because translation definitely came to me as came to me through the through the back door. It's not something I it's not something I did a course in or though I wish I had. Uh, Sebastian's course sounds very very interesting, uh, and it's not something I I did until very quite until quite late. And uh, yeah, it was as you, as you say, Olivia, because I started uh, we started this magazine called Lalit, which was initially meant to be a bilingual magazine in English and Nepali and other languages, other Nepali languages if possible. But very quickly we found that it was, uh, it was, it was more difficult for us as English, uh, as, as writers writing in English in Nepal. It was, it was, it was difficult for us to commission in Nepali. Uh, it was difficult for us to find people who would translate uh, because, you know, there aren't any, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any translation courses that we, we don't have, uh, you know, People who are formally trained, it's uh, you know a lot of amateurs doing the best they can, and sometimes doing it very well, but most time, most of the time, not. So, I was looking at translations, I was editing them, I was, and eventually, it, it just seemed to make sense to to start trying my hand at translations, as intimidating as it as as it sounded, as it seemed uh, to begin with. Uh, so yeah, it was just it, it just really came came about in that way, and. Uh, just like Anli was saying, we were also looking into doing a translation issue. So volume eight of Lalit is a translation issue. And uh, because I didn't feel at the time up to the task, we requested uh, Manjushri Thapa, who's a very well-known Nepali writer who does a lot of transla tra translating. Uh, we requested her to be the guest editor for that issue. And so, so we went about, so the idea was, uh, and I've, uh, I think uh, Kate, Sh Kate Griffin, from NCW shared uh, an editorial from 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 that issue by Manjushri Thapa, which which talks about the difficulties of finding people to translate from Nepali into English and uh, the extreme difficulty of finding people to translate from any of the you know hundred other language Nepali languages into into English. So we we kind of struggled with that, and uh, you know the only way in which the editors could contribute was to translate. Uh, mostly from Nepali into English. So I tried my hand at translating a short story, which seemed to go pretty well, I thought. And since then, I've been, I've been occasionally foraying into translating a short story here, an essay here. And uh, as I mentioned, this uh, novella by, by Parijat is, uh, was a great opportunity for me to translate something which was, you know, not very long, about twelve or 13,000 words. 
uh, but it's the longest transition I've I've undertaken, and it's been it's been a very interesting interesting experience for me, and uh, interesting also because uh, this writer Parijat, uh, she was uh, she was she's very well known for a single novella uh, called Sirish Kuful, which translates as Blue Mimosa, which is a very existential kind of novel novella she wrote in the in, in the nineteen sixties. It's kind of very Albert Camus kind of kind of stuff. And she isn't really well known for anything other than this novella and a couple of other poems and a couple of short stories. But she wrote about a dozen other uh, other novels and novellas. So I thought it was a good opportunity for me to kind of bring something completely different to light, something which was popular when it came out in the in the late 80s, published in a fragmentary form in Nepali language journals. But nobody had, you know, I hadn't heard of it before I started looking around for things to publish, to translate. Sorry. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something which is which has come to me via writing, editing, a uh, literary magazine, and I hope to be doing a lot more of it in the future when mm. I can find the time for it. Yeah, th thank you. No, I was going to ask you about how um, how uh, you go about the translation process and and um, do you pitch to to publishers and so on. Um, but Rabbi, it sounds like mainly. Uh, you, uh, because of the literary magazine that you run, you find examples of those that could eventually be developed into uh, uh, an entire book that you would translate and pitch to uh, a publisher. Is that right? In your case, uh, partially, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's in a place like Kathmandu, I find I find that a lot of creative endeavors there's there's a lot of space to do these things, whether it's you know uh, literature or any or music or anything else. But you really have to do it yourself, because you're not going to get government funding for it. You have to look for the funding yourself, or or bankroll it yourself. Uh, there are no formal channels; everything is informal, mostly. Uh, so, yeah, with translation, it's it's more or less the same. If you want to do something, you approach the authors yourself. They very rarely have agents to represent them. Uh, most of the time, people don't even ask them if they if you know for the rights. They'll just go ahead and do it. Not necessarily because they think they're going to make a lot of money out of doing it, but just because they're interested in doing it, they're probably going to self-publish it and not make any money money out of it themselves. So nobody makes money really. It's all they're they're all labors of love. So with translation, it's uh, with Lalita I had the opportunity to to commission these things, and uh, and and try my hand at, at them myself. And uh, yeah, and it's it really is a question of getting a feel like-minded people together and saying, can we do this? Do we have the time and the money and the people to do this and and doing it yourself? And, and that's how several translations have happened via Lalit and other associated uh, publishing houses, independent publishing houses. And you know, this includes children's literature, this includes uh, literature, uh, you know, poetry, poetry by women. I think uh, there's been a, there's, there's been a, a friend of ours called Muna Gurung published uh, a translation of uh, of poetry by Sulatana Manandar with Tilted Axis recently. So uh, it's 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 really it's really finding. But but this would have this wouldn't have come about because you know Muna Gurung did a, uh, a course or was based in the was based in the UK and managed to. It would have come out come about through personal connections. So a lot of it is, is is very informal. You meet somebody, and you know if they happen to have some resources, they will you know register your interest, and then and and then try and then try and make something out of it rather than you know a formal pitching process. So I'm 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 just learning about all of this, and it's 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 obviously parallel because I I write fiction and nonfiction myself. It's parallel to these. It's not exactly the same. Right, it's but similar, you're on the other side. But they're of entirely the, different. Of the experience. Yeah, you're, you're on the other side, and and, and you know it's uh, it's they're entirely they're often entirely different channels that you have to approach for for funding or for you know the institutions are different. So it's not quite the same as you know just pitching to Penguin or or whoever. Mm -hmm. And um, Sebastian, how, how do you go about um, with your translations? I mean, for theater, maybe it's different because you'll do it for a live performance that's about to take place. Or, or But have you actually approached, I don't know, for example, uh, publishers in the US or in the UK uh, with plays? Or how does that work for you? 
I haven't yet. Uh, I'm still, let's say, um, in a stage where I'm still trying to explore, let's say, translation strategies and so on. Uh, I know lots of, uh, let's say, theater translators like to work with a um, famous, successful play or are even, let's say, counting down the dates to see uh, when the, the copyright, let's say, expires so they can get their hands onto a classic, for example. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, and also some other colleagues who like to work with uh, living authors because then you get to exchange ideas and ask questions and make sure that, um, let's say, you can work together. Uh, but in my particular case, uh, for these two plays, I have chosen to, to work with uh, friends of mine. I do a bit of acting, and both Guillermo and Matias uh, have written and directed the plays that I am translating. So in a way, I do have this insight on the decisions that were made there. And that is kind of like what motivates me. Like, okay, I know this is here for this reason. And I'm really interesting, interested um, in seeing how I can replicate this or cause the same effect um, in a different language. And also because I think that these are very, very uh, talented artists and very good texts that otherwise would be just conditioned to the Spanish-speaking world, which I also know is like very, very big. But I think there's so much potential in those. So, yeah, for, for the time being, that, that's how it, it works for me. Like, um, helping friends out as I learn a lot. Okay. And, and Lee, you also work for a publishing company, from what I gather. So do you um, pitch the, the books to them that you want to translate into Vietnamese or do they ask you, I mean, they obviously did in the case of Margaret Atwood, but um, do you go to them with, with books that you've read that you, li that you love and you feel should be translated into Vietnamese? Well, I do pitch them a lot of books and I was also turned down a lot. But uh, in the case of uh, my publishing house, it is uh, a little bit different because we are like specialized in translations, so agencies from all around the world often come to us with their catalogs of uh, titles that they think that we would be interested in. And sometimes I, um, like I can uh, have my pick among the catalog if I think this or that title would be good and should be acquired for our publishing house, but. They, they are afraid that they won't uh, find a, a suitable translator for, for it, then I can step in. And uh, I want to say that uh, moreover sometimes I, I pitch titles that I would love to see translated, but I, I'm not, I don't necessarily want to be the translator, so um, I will be the editor for this title. For, for example, recently we have um, Vietnamese sympathizer. I uh, convinced them to buy that title, though it will be very difficult to, to publish and sell in Vietnam. And uh, we have a wonderful translator and I have edited that title. So I think um, being a translator and editors, sometimes you don't feel like you you're being, um, you're changing your career or anything. Uh, to uh, at some point, you only feel that you want a book to be published, to be brought to the audience in the best form that it can be. And you can be the translator, or you can be the editor, or you can be the um, PA, PR officer for it. Uh, it is not important anymore, and the important the important thing is that the book can uh, go to the audience and will be received in all its glories or maybe in all its um, perkiness or something. It's, it sounds like you're well implanted in the in the publishing world, even if it's unstructured, as you as you were saying. Um, but are the books and Lee that you that you choose um, are they? Do you choose them for a political reason in some way? Like, do you feel like the ones that you choose are, are something that you feel like people should be reading in Vietnam or um, that it's almost, uh, let's see, a, a, a 
not a militant position, but a, a, some form of activism that that uh, literary activism we could call it. Um, that you pick the books that you do. I'm not. Uh, I think a very political person, but sometimes I do feel that I love the books with a lot of political contents. But uh, on the other hand, I don't think that I love them for the political contents per se. But um, it's just that the books I love to read, uh, why it it is about um, human life and when it comes to the very depths of the human life and the characters also engaged with the world around them, you will find a lot of it is political. And uh, moreover, I think it also depends on how we define political because uh, I feel like in my life and in the books I have read, the politics is in everywhere. The polit politics is in love and in the family, in the group of friends, and uh, in school. So sometimes it depends on how you read a book. Uh, I can read the Amos Oz book as a book about a familiar, about uh, his love for his mother, or I can read it as a book about the and the fate of the Israeli state or uh, I can read it as a little bit of everything and uh, what I have often seen in my translations is that sometimes uh, what I have often seen with my translated books is that sometimes I love them because they have very good art and they are a marvel Marvel in style, but people will try to and only want to read them for their being political. For example, in Chinatown, the book I am translating into English. When it was translating, when it is, when it was translated into French, people would want to talk about how it dealt with the the life in Moscow in the Gorbachevian era um, how the protagonist lived her life in post-communist Vietnam or things like that but uh, to me it is firstly a, a love story a story about one woman's fate living as a single mom and pining over her, her lost love all the years ago and even if I want to read it from the political angle, I will read it as a book about uh, an immigrant in France and about the xenophobia, the discrimination towards the Chinese in Hanoi in the 1980s. So... The universality of, of the story can be read as universality. It, it, it can be read as universal or it can be read as the fate of the the fate of one character in some in some particular point of time and space. But I want to say is that you will never know if you choose a book for their political meaning or not. Then the reader will whether the whether the readers will find the same thing in the book that you choose. Uh, and uh, the author I'm talking about, what she is a very she I think is a master of style, and she try to to innovate with every book of her, and every book of her is different and is a new play in style. But uh, now she has had seven books translated into French, and the French media, when it talked about her, still used the old title cliché, post-communist Vietnam and uh, Moscow and things like that. And uh, so it is a real injustice to the author and the translated books. And uh, 
when I translate it into English, I often have the fear that my translate my translations will be treated uh, in the same way, and my authors will have the same treatment, and they won't get what they deserve to be, and they won't be read as they deserve to be read as a work of art. Thank you. Um, Sebastian, how about you? Because I know the two plays, the one is about uh, um, autism and the other one is um, uh, plays on gender. So is that for you a, a political decision given your um, context in Argentina or your, your, your life there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I chose those uh, specific plays because um, after seeing their performance, I felt challenged and I, I, I felt something. I left the venue with all feelings just on my hand. Uh, so that is, let's say, um, some good uh, criteria, let's say, to choose something to, to translate. And so I was challenged and now I take the challenge of, of trying to make some other people feel this in in another language that uh motivates me to to put let's say every word under a magnifying glass to see what it's doing there what's the intention um so in that sense it's 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 very political at least with these two plays that i'm working on now and especially because um with when you're translating plays you don't you don't have a reader which means that once that word is spoken, the the audience only has that one chance. So I find myself uh, thinking everything uh, twice. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, the fact that uh, by these two plays, I'm kind of contributing to more representation of identities and, and equality, hopefully, um, makes me very happy. Also because um, like my double identity during the day, I also happen to be a, a sworn translator. So I spend some, some good time translating uh, official paperwork, like certificates and uh, high school diplomas and et cetera, et cetera. And um, lately I, I have, let's say, fortunately, I've been able to, let's say, make the connection and see that even doing those types of translation, it's also political. Uh, recently, I got to translate a marriage certificate uh, between two men uh, because one of them wanted to settle here in Argentina. And two worlds that I thought were pretty different, uh, much like Hannah Montana, ended up being uh, similar. I'm both contributing to, let's say, the same situation that I want to contribute to. Mm, mm, thank you. That's very interesting. And Rabbi, um how about you? Because I read your editorial about uh, translation and what was so interesting was um, reading about uh, all the different languages in Nepal, um, but how Nepali is the only official language. And um, I imagine that there are many languages to choose from that you would translate into English. Um, so for you, is this, is this something that you want to put forth? Uh, when you choose your, your translations or what you commission to be translated? Because I imagine you don't translate from all these different languages, but from Nepali. Right. I wish I, wish, I, wish I could. <laughs> uh, I, I, should, I should say that the, the, the editorial that was, that was shared earlier is, is not by me. It's by Manishri Thapa. Mm, uh, sorry. No, yes. no, rel no relative. The, 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 the writer translator I, I spoke about earlier. But yeah, it's... Uh, the act of translation in you know from Nepali languages and which Nepali languages you choose is obviously political. I myself, you know, I'm interested in politics, but I don't consider myself a particularly political person. Uh, you know, as Sebastian said, I, I would have to a work of literature would have to speak to me in other ways, it would have to fill me with with other feelings for me to want to take 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 on this the very the quite on, usually onerous task of of translation. Uh, Lalit itself isn't the magazine isn't particularly political either, but Nepal is a very political political place uh, uh, these in the last couple of decades particularly. But a lot of it, to my mind, a lot of it to my mind is is a lot. There's a lot of politicking 
and there's a lot of focus from the media on the on the politics of what goes on in parliament rather than you know sociopolitical issues and how society might be changing for the better or worse so a lot of the media does focus on this a lot of writers also focus on on, on this kind of politics it's not and that's not something i'm especially interested in because it, to me it seems very very circular and you know ultimately futile however if something is uh, you know we try to be politically aware of course and uh, in the right way and uh, you know if even if i don't choose something to be translated on the basis of its politics quite often it might be the case that whoever is providing the resources or making the suggestion for something to be translated is choosing it for a political reason so uh for example i translate i translated an essay uh, written uh, an essay which is based on is kind of an oral history of somebody from a very a low caste an untouchable caste in nepal and you know this had been published in in in, in a national newspaper in nepali and somebody suggested that i translate translated into english which i did because i i probably wouldn't have come across it if somebody hadn't suggested it to me so sometimes things come to you from from political sources as it were in terms of choosing languages i mean obviously as you know i speak nepali i speak english hence i translate from nepali into english and i don't have the resources myself uh and as the editorial you mentioned uh, points out it's very difficult to find people who not necessarily who speak the other nepali languages the the dozens of other nepali languages but somebody who has the resources and the time to translate it into in you know or to bridge the the gap you know some, sometimes you you will be translating something from say the tamang language which is originally be translated into nepali and then to english because there's nobody to translate from tamang directly into english so so so, so these are the issues that that we face and with with that uh transition issue it really it really came to a head because we realized that at the end of the day we we really were only translating nepali into english for the most part we had a few translations from uh nepal bhasha which is the language spoken by the original inhabitants of the kathmandu valley into uh, directly into english but we only had a handful of other direct translations from other languages some of which are you know just oral languages so it's it's just an impossible task but the the what manjushri tapa concluded and what we agreed with was that this is only one iteration of what can be done in a transition issue and you know we hope that we'll be able to do another one and that other people with more resources will be able to do a better job of it uh, it's just something that you have to keep on striving striving towards you'll never come up with something that's ideal or perfect but yeah translating from these languages is particularly in the last decade has become quite a political thing to be doing in a, in a good way because a lot of these languages even if they have enough speakers to to maintain themselves are have historically been you know neglected they have never been tra- taught in schools uh like welsh they have been suppressed and oppressed and every translation is 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 a pushback against this and even translating from the other languages into nepali i imagine is somehow a political act um because it of is the uh, strength yeah i mean of, it's yeah yeah i mean it, it reminds it reminds nepali that that they exist because the the irony here of course is that nepali might be considered a, a minority language globally uh so you know you translating from nepali into english may be a bit of a political act but translating from these other languages that nepali has dominated over the last you know, couple of centuries is yeah it's 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 a reminder that they're still here they're still there they're not uh, not all nepali citizens are going to uh, not i should i should correct myself not necessarily citizens not everybody has citizenship not everybody who lives within nepal's boundaries is going to end up speaking the nepali language they they're going to continue speaking their own so called minority languages whether they're uh, indo aryan languages or tibeto burman languages or 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 other languages and so yeah tran- every translation is is a way of reminding the nepali state that uh reminding the nepali state of the political achievements of the last couple of decades we're now we're now a federal state uh 
Britain as opposed to a, a Hindu monarchy. And uh, yeah, transitions are extremely important in this regard. Yeah, I mean, because people say minority language for Nepali, but from your editor, from the editorial, I mean, I read that 24 million people speak Nepali. So I, I mean, it's difficult to call that a, a minority language. It's uh, uh. yeah, and and Nepali is a, it's a, it's one of the national languages of of India as well. Uh, so there are millions of people who speak it, you know, Nepali origin people who live in India are Indian citizens who's, who speak it. So it's by no means a minority language in Nepal, mm. but uh, everything else is a minority language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Lee, you, you decided um, just recently to translate Chinatown, which, which won the Penn Award, um, into English. So this is your first uh, translation into English. Um, what made you decide to to want to 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 launch yourself in in translating into English? Actually, I didn't choose to translate Chinatown into English. I can say that is a, a happy accident when uh, Deborah Smith uh, found me and asked me if I wanted to translate this title, and uh, it was um, a little bit like an act of faith too because I haven't done any uh, serious translation into English before so she asked me to to uh, to try to translate a sample and uh, to undergo a test but this one happened to be one of my favorite books in college and the author or was uh, kind of one of um, the one who I looked up to when I think of uh, uh, an author should be what an author should be like uh, a modern and cosmopolitan author should be should write like so I accepted and I passed the test and uh, yeah and I finished the translation it is quite short and uh, so far, I have, I think, a quite amicable relationship towards my editor, who who is a wonderful listener and who can discuss with me problems of translations as well as politics in the translation, the the very little things that maybe other people won't recognize to avoid other translation to turn into another rewriting of the text to suit some preconception. And uh, I also, and, and the other too, she is uh, very understanding and she helped with me, she helped me a lot to, to work with her books. And um, because she has uh, many experiences working with, working on her trans French translations, she can give me some guidelines as to where I can and I can't do with my translation. So uh, it was, it has been a very rewarding experience. Thank you. Um, Sebastian, you translated first from uh, English into Spanish and then you started to do Spanish into English or how did that work for you? That is correct. Only recently I have uh, gotten the confidence to start translating into English. Um, but mostly uh, in my first years, I was just like translating into uh, Spanish. And you did plays as well, screenplays and always in theater? Uh, plays, usually. Um, but that was part, let's say, of, of my training, let's say. So never a full play, just like... Um, random scenes from, from different plays or workshops or trainings. And do you feel like uh, translating into English is sort of, it's going quite smoothly or? So far, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, let's say, the biggest obstacle in that more than the language or let's say the problems that I find. Um, so I, I have just said how I like to put every single word under a magnifying glass. And uh, in these two plays that I'm working with, with, with my friends who are the, the playwrights, I see that some things that uh, would 
let's say, involve an, an obstacle or, let's say, something culturally different and hard to explain, uh, we're not even there for, say, a specific reason. So just to give you an example, we have this um, meal in Argentina called merienda, which is like a second breakfast you would have at 6 p.m.-ish. A snack. And, yeah. uh, a snack, exactly. But we would have dinner at like 9 p.m., 10 p.m. So merienda is the thing. Like I wouldn't say a ritual, but it's like a social event as well. Uh, and especially when you are a kid, merienda time is the best time because that is where you have like chocolate milk with cookies and you hang out with friends. And that uh, obviously takes place in the girl who was Irano. And um, I was like, well, but this is merienda. So this says a lot. We cannot simply just, it's a snack because it, for us, if you invite a friend over after school for merienda, it's like you're actually friends and they go to your place with your parents and so on. And I presented, let's say, this big, big, big problem for me, the playwright. And he was like, well, but not really a big deal. They just get together. It could take place anywhere. Um, so I guess it's just myself in my head. Uh, let's say the biggest obstacle when translating into English. But that's interesting because in a lot of texts now, they're leaving a lot of the, the words that appear in the, in the original text. So, I mean, you could almost leave merienda in there and... Um, uh, and then explain somehow the ritual in in some other way. That is something that I'm I'm really learning to do now. Like, yeah, absolutely, this can stay here. Um, I'm thinking like um, Anne Lee just mentioned that where she learned a lot of English just from playing video games and then looking up words in a dictionary. And usually, uh, maybe I'm underestimating the audience, but saying like the word merienda in a performance and out of nowhere in English, where would that go? There's really no time to go look, uh, look up that word. But then again, um, absolutely doable. So that is something that I'm exploring as well. But yeah, you were saying? Uh, no, I was actually going to ask you, uh, move on to the, the last question, <laughs> because uh, we're sort of coming to the end of our time. But I, since we're talking, Sebastian, with you, um, like which part of your translation experience has been the, the most unique or, or formative and perhaps then An Lee and Rabbi, you can also answer it, but very, very briefly, because we don't have much time left. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Um, so it's, I think it's the most formative parts and the most crucial parts of, of my training are getting together with people who share, let's say, that passion. In 2019, uh, the Out of the Wings Collective and the Argentinian Association of, of Translators create like a full week, like immersion uh, workshop where we got the chance to, let's say, work with actors, with playwrights, with directors, with uh, theater translators. And just that connection point, gathering together and uh, sharing ideas, exchanging, and being able to see the whole chain, right? How um, theater at the end of the day is an act of trusting and handing in your job to somebody else, right? So the author or the playwright uh, hands it into a director who then trusts uh, in a, somebody who does the cast and so on and so on. And uh, that was very insightful and enlightening for me uh, together with uh, the very recent summer school from BCLT. Uh, which was online, but also uh, very, very similar. And at that point, I realized that my, let's say, obstacles that I thought were only specific to the La Spanish English pair were actually shared by my peers who were translated from many, many different languages. So that was also eye opening. That's lovely. And, um, and Lee, um, in Two minutes so that we can le leave Ravi a bit of time too. Um, can you've, you talked about the loneliness of the translator. So perhaps was that also something for you that was useful to be part of a, uh, where you meet other translators and, and, uh, realize that what you do is, is in the end quite similar? Uh, definitely. 
actually I have been working as an editor for as long as I have been a translator so um, living in a community of translators is something I have been doing for years now and uh, I think yeah it is very good to have um, other translators even uh, both those who are older than you and more experienced who can share with you their solutions and even their mm, mishaps on the way to become what they are now and the younger ones who you in your turn can show them the roles and they in their turn give you some of their enthusiasm and their creati creativity in uh, in the beginning of their ways but uh, I think yeah I, I agree that the beats BCLT uh, workshop has been a very rewarding experience for me as well because this is my I'm working on my first translation into English and I met with a lot of other problems that I haven't ever thought of when I worked into my uh, out tongue so uh, meeting with other translations who maybe some of them also worked into English as their second or third languages and listen to their experience have been very encouraging when I am um, seeing myself at the start of a new translation journey again and uh, find myself to be an apprentice again and uh, I, I do hope that uh, I can join this community and be a part of which in, in years to come and uh, yeah and hope to be read by my colleagues too. Thank you and and Rabbi how about you what what has been the most uh, uh, rewarding in your translation experience? Uh, thanks Olivia. Uh, yeah I, I wouldn't separate out translation by itself because a lot of my translation has been within the context of uh, writing and editing a literary magazine. So we even with translations, we've been collaborating with each other. So it's not, it hasn't been quite as lonely as uh, as as the as the cliche goes, so to speak. But uh, yeah, I, I think the, the 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 whole sense of connection with each which, with each other with with my colleagues on on Lalit has been incredible over the years. And uh, but with every transition that you that you do do, you you also feel that you're connecting to. You're connecting other people, you know, people who read in who don't read in the original language. You're connecting them to, you know, the the writers, to the cultures, the cultures and the politics and the society that they're talking about. So, every translation that you do, however small, kind of gives you gives you gives you that self of affirmation that you're doing something, something 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 of value. Uh, in terms of you know the most formative experience, I, I would argue that since I'm really at the beginning of my transition career and I don't know how much I'll actually have the time to do I, I, I'm really looking forward to potential collaboration with uh, strangers press and uh, writers in Nepal in, in in bringing up bringing out these bringing out this this series of chapbooks I think that'll be an incredible experience so I'm really looking forward to that mm. thanks thank you so much and thank you so much all three of you for being with us and um uh, bravo to all translators and, and happy International Translation Day <laughs> to you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia.